Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in the third installment of the Take Action webinar series. I'm Mark Lauk, Swede scientist at The Ohio State University, and I'll be moderating today. This series is designed to bring you valuable information on weed and herbicide resistance management topics. It's a collaborative effort between the Take Action Program and Land Grant University Weed Scientists. Joining us this week, we have Dr. Pat Trannell from the University of Illinois. Hi, Pat, how are you this morning? I'm good, Mark, thanks. Uh, and Dr. Amit Jala uh, from the University of Nebraska. Hello, Amit. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin, I'll just provide a little bit more information on the basics of the Take Action program. Uh, farmers' freedom to operate is being threatened by the increase and spread of pesticide resistance. The consequences include short and long-term economic challenges, decreasing land values, the uncertain regulatory pathway to access crop protection tools, crop losses, and other challenges. Take Action is a farmer-focused education platform designed to help farmers and their advisors manage herbicide, fungicide, and insecticide resistance, insect resistance. The goal is to encourage the adoption of management practices that lessen the impact of resistant pests and preserve current and future crop protection technology. Take Action is brought to you by the Soy Checkoff. For more information on Take Action, visit www.iwilltakeaction.com. A reminder as we get started that you can submit questions at any time by typing them into the questions box on the right side of your screen. Uh, we will answer these questions probably following the second presentation, and we do appreciate your questions. Our first presenter is Dr. Pat Trannell. Pat Trannell joined the University of Illinois in 1997, where he currently holds the Ainsworth Professorship in the Department of Crop Sciences. His research program uses molecular and genomics tools to address weed science issues, and his lab is internationally recognized for its numerous contributions that have increased our understanding of the evolution and underlying mechanisms of herbicide resistance. And I will turn it over to you, Pat. All right, thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again to Mark and the other organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you about uh, metabolic-based herbicide resistance and multiple herbicide resistance. I think these two uh, topics or this, this, these types of herbicide resistance are the greatest threat to, our, uh, to the sustainability of our contemporary weed management systems. And so obviously this is an important topic and uh, we need to be aware of it if we want to continue to effectively manage weeds. So let me start out today with some definitions. There we go. Uh, Start out with some definitions. So first of all, several terms I'm going to be using today uh, that I want you to be familiar with. And so the first of these is target site resistance. And target site resistance is resistance due to a change in the herbicide site of action. Typically herbicides bind enzymes in a plant and that specific enzyme that a herbicide binds is referred to as its site of action. When we have target site resistance, what happens is that that enzyme changes due to a mutation in the gene that encodes that enzyme, and the change in that enzyme prevents the herbicide from binding to it, or, or at least reduces the affinity at which that herbicide is able to bind to that enzyme. And so when the herbicide can no longer bind to the enzyme, that herbicide can't do its job, it can't kill the plant, and so the plant is resistant. So that's target site resistance. The other type of or category of resistance is what we refer, what we refer to as non-target site resistance. And this is kind of a catch-all term for everything other than a target site change. And so I'll be giving you some specific examples of non-target site resistance later. But for now, just keep in mind that there's these two general broad categories of herbicide resistance. There's target site resistance and there's non-target site resistance. A couple other terms that um, I want to that I'll be using include cross resistance. So cross resistance occurs when evolution of resistance to one herbicide results in resistance to another herbicide. So another way to think about this is there's a single mechanism in the plant, one mechanism, one resistance mechanism in a plant, which is able to confer resistance to multiple different herbicides. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, another type of, uh, uh, or another term would be multiple resistance, which is when a plant or a population possesses more than one resistance mechanism. And so in, in both cases with cross resistance and multiple resistance, you have 
plants that can survive or that are resistant to multiple herbicides. The, the primary distinction there is cross-resistance. It's a single mechanism conferring resistance to multiple herbicides, whereas multiple resistance is the stacking of several mechanisms within, within a plant. And so one example that might be familiar to, to some of you would be uh, some of our traded crops now, uh, our herbicide resistant crops. Often they have, for example, dicamba resistant soybeans not only have a dicamba resistance trait in there, but they typically also will have a, a glyphosate resistance or a glyphosate tolerance trait as well. So just like there are multiple mechanisms of resistance in that crop, we can have weeds that can evolve these multiple mechanisms. So let me give you some examples that will illustrate some of these terms and how we want to use these terms and, and what they mean. <clears throat> so here's an example of cross resistance. So let's say that you had a field, you had a population of giant ragweed, and you had been using this herbicide classic for you know several years in a row to control that giant ragweed. What potentially could happen then is that giant ragweed population could evolve target site resistance to classic. And classic is a group two herbicide, and so we would have what we would refer to as group two target site resistance. Well, this population, this giant redwood population, likely would also be cross resistant to other group two herbicides. And the, and the reason for that is, well, the, the key there is to, to keep in mind is that when you have target site resistance to a particular group of herbicides, or, or to one herbicide, you typically will have cross resistance to other herbicides in that having that same target site. So if you remember back, or if you heard our, our webinar a couple weeks ago, Christy Sprague uh, spent quite a bit of time talking about this table. I've turned it sideways so you could uh, fit it on the slide here. It's still too small to read, but this is a color coded table. And the purpose of this color coding in this table is really to, um, tell you how to or help you rotate your herbicide sites of action, rotate uh, your group numbers, and to mix herbicides with different group numbers. And so the, the, the reason that Christy spent so much time and, and, and the reason we have a table to help you do that is because of this target site resistance that I just talked about. When you get target site resistance to, to one herbicide, it often will confer resistance to other herbicides from that same target site. So that's an example of cross resistance. Here's an example of multiple resistance. So several of our growers in the Midwest that have dealt with water hemp have experienced this example where they had water hemp populations back in the 80s and the, the 90s. They were using ALS inhibiting herbicides to control water hemp. And so repeated use of these ALS inhibitors resulted in their water hemp populations evolving target site resistance or, or maybe not target site resistance, it may have been non-target site resistance, but Nevertheless, they evolved resistance to group two herbicides. So then in 1996, they had the opportunity to start spraying glyphosate with Roundup Ready crops. And so the same fields that had uh, group two resistant water hemp, they started spraying those with this group nine herbicide glyphosate, which led to over several years, led to the evolution of, of group nine resistance in these same populations. So then these farmers may have started adding a PPO inhibiting herbicide and selecting for PPO resistance or or group 14 resistance in these same population. So what happened is they sequentially stacked these resistance traits together in the population. And so in this case, they ended up with what we'd say are three-way multiple resistant populations of water hemp. So one of the points I wanna make about this multiple resistance is that it can occur at, or we can describe it as at a, the individual plant level, or we can also describe it as occurring at the field level, okay? So what do I mean by this? So here's two hypothetical populations, uh, field one and field two. The little green squiggly thing there is supposed to be a weed, and then I've indicated uh, whether that weed had resistance to uh, herbicide A or herbicide B, or over here in field two, we had some plants that were resistant to herbicide A and B. So if you look at these two fields, if you were to spray field one with herbicide A, you have some uh, plants that are resistant to that herbicide, and so you would you would not get great control, and so you would conclude that I have uh, herbicide or I have resistance to herbicide A. So maybe the next year you'd use herbicide B. You, you have some plants that are resistant to herbicide B. You wouldn't get great control with herbicide B, so you conclude that you had resistance to herbicide B. So in fact, in this field, you have multiple resistance to herbicide A and B. Field two, similarly, you have multiple resistance to herbicide A and B, 
But the difference, one of the differences between field one and field two is if you used a tank mix combination, if you sprayed both herbicide A and B at the same time to field one, you would get good control. Whereas field two, that would not be the case. And the difference there is that although both populations or both fields have multiple resistance to A and B, only in field two do you have individual plants that have multiple resistance to herbicide A and B. And so again, an implication of this is over here in field one, tank mixing A and B could be a viable strategy that would give you good weed control. Now, it's not something we'd recommend because it's not gonna be long-term sustainable. You're gonna quickly, uh, those plants are probably gonna quickly combine those traits and you're gonna develop, or those plants will evolve multiple resistance. But the reason I emphasize this point is the reality that the reality that we have today with some of our, our tough weed populations, some of our tough resistant populations, is they have already stacked several of these different traits together. So, for example, in water hemp, we have populations that have two, three, four, five-way resistances in those populations. But what you have to keep in mind is that these populations that have, say, five-way resistance, that doesn't mean that every single plant in that field has five-way resistance. So this, this, this picture here, which is showing these different combinations of resistance, really is the reality of a lot of our water hemp populations today. And so one of the, the key points here is that, okay, you have in this field resistance to herbicide A. So you might say, well, there's no point in using herbicide A in this field because I have resistance to it. Well, that's not completely true because actually herbicide A could bring you some value to this field. Now, again, it doesn't mean that herbicide A is going to be a standalone solution and we're going to recommend that you just use herbicide A. But let's say that you're going into this field and you're wanting to use dicamba, for example, and you don't want dicamba resistance to evolve. Adding herbicide A plus dicamba would have some benefit because, again, even though you have resistance to herbicide A in this field, a lot of plants are sensitive to herbicide A. And so by adding that tank mix combination, you would reduce the number of plants that are being exposed to essentially only dicamba because um, you would be killing some of the plants with herbicide A or at least be providing another effective mode of action on some of those plants. And I want to take back to an example that I believe was Rodrigo Worley presented a couple weeks ago in this webinar series. And he gave the example of how in a water hemp population, he was showing the, the increased control that you would see with increasing number of tank mix partners. And in one, of, in one of these cases, he actually showed that by adding an ALS inhibitor, there was increased control. And this happened even though we, he knew that that population had resistance to those uh, ALS inhibitors. So again, just because you have resistance to a particular herbicide in your field, that doesn't mean every plant has resistance. And obviously, we'd like you to be using, you know, two effective herbicide, uh, two or more effective herbicides for which there is no resistance. But again, with some of these, these tough water hemp populations that we have, we don't really have that luxury anymore of having two resist or two herbicides for which there's already no resistance. Okay, so now I want to shift gears and talk about non-target site resistance. And as remember, I said that non-target site resistance is this catch-all category for any resistance mechanism other than a target site change. And there's some examples here. I'm not going to read all of them to you. Um, the most common one is increased detoxification or metabolism. So what happens in this case is the plant acquires the ability to metabolize the herbicide and to detoxify that herbicide. So there's, again, there's several different types of non-target site resistance. This metabolic type seems to be the most important. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, for the rest of this webinar. But before I do that, I do wanna mention that some of these other ones are important as well. So glyphosate resistance in horseweed is quite common. And, the, and, and in that case, most of the resistance apparently is due to an altered translocation mechanism. So there are, again, multiple non-target site resistance mechanisms. Some of them are, are, are all of them have some importance, but again, this this metabolic type of non-target site resistance is probably the most important. So what do we mean by metabolic target site resistance? Well, something that you might be able to relate to is, is the answer to this rhetorical question here is why do in most cases do our crops not injured by the herbicide? And the answer to that is because that crop is able to metabolize the herbicide, okay? And so what happens is basically these weeds are evolving or mimicking what the crop is already doing. They evolve the ability to metabolize that herbicide to basically remove that herbicide from the system so it's not able to injure the plant. And so here's a nice example showing how these weeds are mimicking the crop. 
And so what this graph shows is the, uh, the amount of parent herbicide, this is atrazine. This is a, an example of atrazine resistant water hemp. So this graph shows the amount of atrazine that remains over time. And so this is normal water hemp, this top curve, and you can see that the atrazine is slowly, very slowly metabolized. So the atrazine is basically remaining in the plant, and then that's why the atrazine is able to kill the water hemp. Corn, shown by this bottom curve here, you can see the atrazine very rapidly is degraded by the plant. And again, that's why corn is able to tolerate atrazine. It's able to detoxify that, that herbicide molecule and, and metabolize it into non-toxic uh, compounds. These two curves here in the middle are two different biotypes of water hemp that have evolved metabolic-based atrazine resistance. And you can see that they are, they're not quite as fast as corn, but they are basically mimic, mimicking corn. They are metabolizing that herbicide almost as fast as corn is doing it. Okay, so that's kind of a nutshell what this metabolic herbicide resistance is. And so you might be asking, well, who cares? Why do we, why do we care whether it's metabolic resistance, non or, or if it's target site resistance, it's resistant, we need to use a different herbicide. The reason we need to be concerned about this metabolic-based herbicide resistance is that it confers unpredictable cross resistance, okay? Going back to target site resistance, I emphasize with what I think is my first example how when you have target site resistance, what that means is you will have cross resistance to herbicides that have that same site of action. And so, you know, even though it's bad that you have this additional resistance to other herbicides, it's, it's nice in the sense that it's predictable, okay? That's why we can manage target site resistance by rotating our group numbers, okay? Again, going back to what Christy talked about, the importance of knowing your group numbers and rotating those. We can very effectively manage target site resistance by rotating group numbers and using multiple effective group number herbicides uh, in, in a single application. Unfortunately, with metabolic-based resistance, the, the cross-resistance, again, is very unpredictable. If you have metabolic-based resistance, the herbicides to which that plant will be cross-resistant depend on the molecular handle of the chemical, okay? It depends on the chemical structure of that herbicide, and it doesn't matter what the site of action of that herbicide is. So we can have metabolic cross-resistance that spans across herbicides with different sites of action or spans across different group number herbicides. So what do I mean by molecular handle? So let me give you an example of this. So this is an example, again, with this metabolic atrazine resistant in water hemp. And so here you're looking at a dose response curve showing a sensitive population is controlled by normal field use rate of this herbicide atrazine, whereas the resistant population is not, it's resistant to atrazine. You take that same population and you spray it with amitrin. This is an older compound. Uh, it's in the same group as atrazine, so it's also a photosystem II inhibitor there is no difference in the curves between this resistant and sensitive biotype. In other words, the resistant plant, the plant that's resistant to atrazine is not resistant to amitrin, even though both of these herbicides have the same site of action. And what's more, if you look at the chemical structures of these herbicides, they're extremely similar. In fact, they're identical with the exception of atrazine has a chlorine at this position, whereas amitrin has this, what we call a thiomethyl group at this position. And we now know in this particular case that the enzyme that metabolizes atrazine targets this chlorine group. And so that's why when there's not a chlorine group here, and so this would be an example of that molecular handle I mentioned, this has a different molecular handle that that herbicide, or I'm sorry, that that metabolic metabolizing enzyme is not able to recognize this molecular handle. And so we, we know this now because, you know, work has been done and we know the enzyme that, that's carrying out this metabolism. But the challenge is that in most of our metabolic resistance, there's, there's potentially hundreds of enzymes that could be carrying out the metabolism. And in most of our cases, we don't know what that specific enzyme is, and therefore we cannot predict the molecular handle that it's using, and therefore we cannot predict the cross resistance that's going to uh, be conferred. So here's another example of sort of this unpredictable cross resistance coming from a commercial example. So this example is with the Enlist technology. So Enlist corn has resistance to, because of this Enlist trait, the trait that was put in, it's an enzyme that's able to metabolize 2,4-D. And so Enlist corn has 2,4-D uh, resistance, just like Enlist soybeans have 2,4-D resistance. Well, the, the reason they're resistant to 2,4-D is there's, they put in these crops carry an enzyme, which is able to cleave this group in the 2,4-D molecule where the red arrow is there. Well, it turns out that other herbicides that are called FOP herbicides, so these would be some of the group one herbicides, Quizalifop or Assure2 would be an example. 
It has a very different structure than 2,4-D overall, and it's got a completely different target site. It's a group number, different group number herbicides. It's Quisalifops group one, 2,4-D is group, uh, group four herbicide. But that's irrelevant to this metabolism resistance because there's a molecular handle here, which is very similar in Quisalifop uh, to 2,4-D. And so the same enzyme that can recognize this 2,4-D handle to metabolize 2,4-D can also metabolize recognize this handle to detoxify quizalifop. So again, in this case, we can predict it because we know what the enzyme is, but if you didn't know the enzyme that was involved, you look at the structures of those, you would not have been able to predict that this one enzyme, we can confer cross resistance to these two herbicides. Okay, so here's some you know scary possibilities with this unpredictable cross resistance. And so the, this first example is not a possibility, this is a reality, this has played out uh, a couple of decades ago, probably uh, in Australia, where ryegrass populations were being targeted with group one herbicides. And after sequential use of group one herbicides, these populations evolved resistance. So farmers switched to group two herbicides. And you know, unfortunately to their dismay, it turned out that these populations that had never seen group two herbicides before were already resistant to these group two herbicides, simply because they had selected enzymes that could metabolize the group one herbicides, which also recognized a similar molecular handle of group two herbicides and could also metabolize the group two herbicides. Another example, and this is, this is uh, uh, a little bit more hypothetical. I don't know if this is exactly true or not, but we, we do know that we have water hemp populations that have evolved resistance to, among other herbicides, the chloracetamide group 15 herbicides and HPPD inhibitors. Um, and so normally we would think, well, adding a chloracetamide and an HPPD inhibitor, two different group number herbicides would be a good resistance management strategy. But, you know, as I said, we have water hemp plants that can metabolize both of these herbicides. Are they using the same enzyme to metabolize these herbicides? That we don't know at this point, but it's possible they could be. And if that's the case, tank mixing them would be the, the exact wrong thing to do from a resistance management standpoint, because you'd be selecting for the same metabolizing enzyme. And if we extrapolate this unpredictable cross resistance out farther into the future, then we come to the conclusion that we are probably selecting for weed populations that have already re evolved resistance to herbicides that we have not yet discovered. Okay. I don't have data to show you that this has happened, but with these weed populations accumulating these different met metabolizing enzymes, I'm sure that there are potential chemicals out there, again, yet to be discovered, that could be really good herbicides and maybe would, would, would have been really good herbicides 10 years ago, but they would no longer be effective now because our populations have basically evolved cross-resistance to them. Okay, so the last piece of data I want to share with you is this slide here, and, and this shows the chronology over time of the, the different target site, or I'm sorry, the different resistance mechanisms we've discovered in water hemp. And the point I want to make here is, you know, up until about 20, uh, 2011, four of our five known resistance mechanisms in water hemp were due to target site changes. We only knew of one non-target site mechanism. However, since 2011, all new cases of mechanisms that we've discovered in water hemp have been non-target site resistance mechanisms. And most of these have been metabolic based uh, resistance. And so in fact, we have seven different types of uh, herbicide resistances in water hemp or seven different groups of, uh, of herbicides to which water hemp has evolved resistance. For six of those seven groups, we, have, we know of non-target site mechanisms. We only know of target site mechanisms for four of them. So in the past, you know, again, uh, prior to 2011, we thought water hemp resistance was basically a target site resistance problem. And so most of the management recommendations we've been making uh, through the years for herbicide resistance management have, have focused on the fact that we probably had target site resistance. And so those management recommendations for target site resistance do not work necessarily as well for non-target site resistance. And actually, I just noticed there's a typo here, chloracetamides, they should be a group 15 herbicide. Okay, so this is my last slide, my take home messages. So we populations continue to stack resistance mechanisms. This is that multiple resistance that we talked about. And I didn't really talk about this, the second point here, but once you get these mechanisms in your population, they typically don't go away, you're stuck with them. Metabolic resistance is becoming increasingly common in some of our wheat populations, as I just illustrated with water hemp. And so herbicide rotation and mixture is a great strategy for, for 
delaying and managing target site resistance are less effective for mitigating metabolic based resistance. And that's again because of this unpredictable cross resistance. We can't tell you necessarily which two herbicides might be metabolized by that same uh, metabolic mechanism. So don't take me wrong. I, I don't want you to say that, oh, Trano told us not to rotate modes of action. We still want you to rotate modes of action and use mixtures of multiple effective modes of action because we still have to worry about target site resistance, but we also have to be aware of this non-target site resistance. And finally, because of this challenge in, in using herbicides and, and not knowing the right combinations of herbicides to use to manage and mitigate metabolic resistance, that basically highlights the need that we can't just rely on chemicals. We have to start relying more and more on non-chemical weed management strategies. So this is my final slide. I'll just leave the take-home messages up here. And if, or, I don't know, Mark, if we're going to answer questions at this point or move on to the next uh, webinar. I think we'll move on in the interest of time. Um, let, me, let me advance this slide. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Amit Jala. Amit is an associate professor and extension weed management specialist in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Before joining the faculty at University of Nebraska, Amit was a postdoctoral scientist at the University of California, Davis, and also University of Florida. Amit's responsibility in his current position is to provide research and extension network for weed control in corn, soybean, sorghum, and popcorn in eastern Nebraska. His research program is focused on the biology, gene flow, and management of herbicide resistance weed, resistant weeds. And for more information on his program, you can go to agronomy.unl.edu. J-H-A-L-A. And I will turn it over to you, Amit. Thanks for joining us today. Rem Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lux, uh, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss uh, about uh, pollen-mediated uh, gene flow and uh, how the pollen movement uh, can also transfer uh, herbicide-resistant alleles from resistant to susceptible weed species, uh, particularly focusing on uh, common water hemp, uh, which has been uh, widespread uh, in several Midwestern United States. So first of all, I would like to give you some information about uh, what actually do you mean by pollen mediated gene flow, because this is kind of uh, something new word it has been used before but not particularly in weed science discipline so a simple definition of uh, pollen mediated gene flow is the transfer of genetic information from one plant to another compatible plant so there should be a compatibility between two plants to transfer the gene flow so it could be intraspecific gene flow means within species and it could also be interspecific gene flow that will be between species and again, this is not something new. If you will read the literature, there have been paper published uh, uh, somewhere in 1997. There was a article in Nature that discusses uh, gene flow from transgenic crops. So it, this is all gene flow debate uh, started when transgenic crops, for example, glyphosate resistant corn and soybean were about to come to the market in 1996 and 1997 and then scientists were worried whether the herbicide resistant plants that were created um, can also uh, create uh, some other issues about gene flow from crops to its compatible organic crops or even the gene flow from crops to its compatible closely related um, weed species. And there have been some books written, for example, this book uh, written by Poppy and Wilkinson discusses the gene flow from GM plants, as well as the another book um, came to the market uh, at that time was to discuss how the crops can outcross with uh, its closely related species and it can transfer the genes. However, the information is not available about gene flow from resistant wheat to susceptible wheat species. And that's why we focused on number of projects in the last four to five years. We were wanted to see once herbicide resistance evolution occur in one population, and then how much are the chances 
or what will be the frequency of outcrossing from those uh, resistant to susceptible weed species. For example, this is debatable whether this is a water hemp field or soybean field, right? You are able to see some soybean rows here in between, but then the entire field is just covered by water hemp. And this is uh, not one single field in Nebraska, but you will be able to see this type of fields in several states uh, in the Midwestern United States. When it comes to pigweeds, basically, these are the two pigweed species, for example, palmer amaranth and common water hemp. They both are dioecious species among the pigweed family. What do we mean by dioecious species? Means male and female plants are separate. Means one plant could be either male plant or another plant could be either female plant. So reproductive organs are present on the separate plant. And here in the picture, we are able to see this is a male water hemp plant and this is female water hemp inflorences. Inflorences means the top reproductive organs in the plant species. So both of them are dioecious species. They have rapid growth rate. They both are prolific seed producers and highly competitive within the crop and they can also emerge throughout the growing season. So these are some best uh, characteristics of uh, palmer amaranth and common water hemp uh, in the cropping systems. So for example, again here, this is a picture where you can see this is a male common water hemp plant and this is female. And this picture was taken from the field. So if, for example, this male common water hemp plant is resistant to some herbicide and if it will outcross with this female water hemp plant, then the seeds produced by this female plant would also be resistant to herbicides that is carried by this male plant. And this is because in most cases, the herbicide resistant is a dominant trait, so it can easily transfer by pollen. Glyphosate resistant common water hemp uh, first uh, evolved in Missouri somewhere in 2008 and then now you can see it has been in several several states in the Midwestern United States and of course the seed movement is possible seed can move from one place to another place by number of ways for example when you transfer the combine when you use one combine in one field and then it, if the field has resistant weeds and if you go back to another field then you are also transferring those seeds that are resistant to some herbicides that will go to the another field and that's how seed movement is important to spread the resistance but which is less known is more about pollen movement so pollen can also transfer the resistant traits which is known as pollen mediated gene flow for example this is a photograph was taken before few years in the soybean field soybean is matured and sometimes this photograph was taken by the late season uh, where you can see there were two female water hemp plants in this field and i was not able to see any male water hemp plant and although the seeds were there seed set was done and this plant had at least 200,000 seeds on this plant so i was wondering like how how it is possible because Female plant by itself cannot produce seeds. There has to be some level of outcrossing. So this female plant must receive some pollen from the male plant for fertilization or for successful seed set. And so within 200 feet area, there was not a single male water hemp plant. So that created some questions in my mind, like there is chances like the pollen is coming from long distance. And that's why we decided to conduct a study about uh, how far the pollen can move and what are the chances of outcrossing from male to female, from resistant to susceptible female. This is the aerial view of uh, gene flow study that we conducted at uh, South Central Ag Lab, uh, which is in South Central Nebraska. This is the outline 
you can see here this is the study we conducted and in my next slide i'm going to give you the close up of this uh, field experiment uh, we conducted so as you can see here in this figure in the center 10 meter square diameter area 80 square meter area we transplanted glycosate resistant water hemp plants about 550 plants were transplanted so we grew them in the greenhouse and then we brought in the field and transplanted in this circle of 80 meter square area and then in surrounding all the cardinal and ordinal directions we transplanted glyphosate susceptible common water hemp plants at different distances for example here from 5 meter 10 meter 15 so up to 50 meter distance in the corner in all the directions like north south east west and also in the corner directions so our resistant plants were considered as a pollen dollar pollen donor blocks and then the susceptible plants in surrounding area were considered as pollen receptor blocks and the idea was here to detect the pollen mediated gene flow from glyphosate resistant water hemp to susceptible water hemp plants. This is how we transplanted all the plants in the field. And then at the end of the season, we basically harvested all the susceptible plants at different distances. And during the growing season, we were removing all the male plants from these susceptible blocks because we were wanted to increase the gene flow from resistant plants that we transplanted in the center of the field to make sure like all these female plants can receive the pollen from the male plants which are transplanted in the center of the plot this is something doesn't happen in the nature under the actual field condition the male and female plants generally coexist together but our hypothesis was just to detect the possibility of outcrossing from the plants transplanted in the center of the field which had glyphosate resistant trait so at the end of the season we harvested seeds of all the susceptible water hemp plants and then we did um, spray them with glyphosate uh, at uh, 1.5 x rate means generally 22 fluorances per acre is generally considered as a label rate. So we applied glyphosate at 1.5 X rate, and then whatever the plant survived, we detected the frequency of gene flow by using this equation. We used uh, all the modeling parameters because in this, we had number of variables. For example, we were wanted to see what is the role of wind speed and wind frequency and also what is the role of direction in terms of uh, outcrossing possibility. So we created total 62 possible models and then we selected the top model based on the AIC values. And this is the model we created and I'm not going to spend too much time on this statistical part, but the idea was because we had number of variables, we were wanted to make sure like our interpretation of this study is uh, well understood and based on this AIC criteria we selected the model which has the lowest value of AIC that was a combination of distance direction and year these are some results from year one uh, and uh, I will go through this very quickly the main idea on x-axis we had distance from the pollen source means uh, remember that our pollen source was glyphosate resistant water hemp and then our y-axis was frequency of gene flow so in all the directions whether it is north south or east west you can see here like the there was a decrease in the frequency of gene flow as the distance increases and this is based on our hypothesis you will get more outcrossing in the area which is near to the pollen source compared with uh, the area which is away from the pollen source because there are more chances that plants will outcross when they will get more pollen and more opportunity for outcrossing 
same results in year two. So this project was repeated for two years under the same field conditions. We also created this wind roses to determine the role of wind speed and wind direction in movement of this pollen because uh, water hem pollens are relatively lightweight and it can also carry over by the movement of wind. These are the results. Uh, so at zero, zero meter distance means in the center of the plant, we also transplanted some susceptible plants and the outcrossing rate was maximum. And that makes sense because they were surrounded by all the resistant plants and they received all the resistant pollen and outcrossing was like up to 77%. And if you will see, go back up to 165 feet, the percent of outcrossing was 5%, which is still very significant number if you consider under the field condition, if a resistant water hemp can also transfer the resistant rate up to 165 feet at 5% rate of outcrossing, which is very significant number. So at least uh, there was no zero basically. That means the pollen can move even more than 165 feet because this was our maximum distance that we have tested in this study was 165 feet and we were able to detect up to 5% level of outcrossing. Almost same results in year two with little more outcrossing percentage even up to the 165 feet distance from the pollen source. This table simply describes the distance where 90% and 50% reduction in gene flow will occur. So in most of the directions, we have seen the 90% reduction will occur at 58 meter distance from the pollen source. And here in second year, we have seen 90% reduction would occur at 87 meter distance from the pollen source. In addition, we also did some molecular tests to make sure like we are not uh, identifying any um, error because of the by spraying glyphosate. So our idea here was to conduct some EPSPS genomic copy number because um, EPSPS gene amplification is the most common mechanism of resistance in pigweed species in addition to some other resistance mechanisms that has been discussed by in my previ in previous presentation by Dr. Tranel. But in our case, this was susceptible that means the susceptible water hemp plant has generally one EPSPS copy number. If you compare with these are the resistant plants and then we also created some F1 population as well as some F2 population where relative EPSPS copy number were more than one. That was basically in the range of somewhere between four to 12 EPSPS copy number means they were all the resistant plants. We have also published this paper. We don't have too much time here to discuss all the details, but if you want to see some more information, this paper is published uh, before a few years and it is also available on this Nature website. And this is again, want to emphasize the occurrence of glyphosate resistant water hemp in the Midwestern United States. Um, it started in Missouri and then it's been there in several other states. So my point here is this is not only due to the seed movement, but the pollen movement uh, from resistant plants can also transfer the resistant LLs and it can make some other susceptible plants resistant because of the movement of pollen. But this is something we ignore because we generally don't see the pollen movement um, by our eyes and that's why it is easy to ignore but uh, it is still creating an issue and so within few years if it will keep traveling like even up to five percent level of outcrossing from its original source up to 165 feet distance which is still a significant number so our conclusion based on this study is pollen mediated gene flow in common water hemp uh, definitely occurs and as I told you before it could occur up to five to nine percent even up to 165 feet distance and it can be reduced by 
50% within the three meter distance and up to 90% at uh, 60 to 90 meter distance, depending on the directions and year in this study. So the bottom line question is, can we prevent gene flow? Not exactly. We cannot basically block the pollen movement because this is a natural phenomenon can occur in any flowering plant. And it has been occurring, but nowadays there is a more importance on this topic because of the widespread occurrence of this resistant weed species. Effective management strategies can help to reduce the gene flow, particularly using soil applied herbicides that can reduce the overall number of plants in the landscape level. Use of multiple effective modes of action that is what discussed by Dr. Trunnell and we have to keep rotation in terms of herbicides, in terms of crops, and that can reduce the overall occurrence of resistant weed species. And also we have to emphasize how best we can reduce the seed production, because if we can reduce the seed production, that can reduce the chances of pollen movement. Uh, for example, if in, in your field, if you have a male and female plants and at the late in the season, if you can eliminate majority of female plants, then you are blocking the production of seed in that particular field. So we have to consider all number of things in mind. Field scouting is also important. And also, as I mentioned, removal of female plants before seed set uh, can be a great strategy, particularly in the species like water hemp and palmer amaranth, because they are obligate uh, outcrossing species and gene flow is the only way for them to produce seeds. So this was the case of uh, water hemp, but giant ragweed, which is also one of the very widely occurring glyphosate resistant and also resistant to other chemistries uh, has been widespread, particularly in states like Ohio and Indiana. They have a huge problem of uh, glyphosate resistant giant ragweed. So one difference between giant ragweed and water hemp is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, water hemp and palmer amaranth are dioecious species, means male and female reproductive organs are separate on the separate plants. In case of giant ragweed, it's a monoecious species, means male and female reproductive organs are present in the same plant. But one typical character of giant ragweed is it can produce significant number of pollens. For example, a single plant of giant ragweed can produce almost a billion pollen grains during its life cycle, particularly during its flowering period. It can produce like a million pollen grains every single day and about a billion pollen during its life cycle. So we also conducted this study to detect the pollen mediated gene flow from glyphosate resistant giant ragweed to susceptible giant ragweed plants under using the same design as we did before. So in the center of this field, we transplanted glyphosate resistant giant ragweed plants and in all the north, south, east, west, and all the cordinal and ordinal directions, we transplanted susceptible giant ragweed plants. And again, similar to last uh, study in water hemp, uh, we let them to outcross and then at the end of the season, we, trans we collected the seeds from all this susceptible population. And then we did some greenhouse screening and we came to know like even in giant ragweed, although it is a monoecious species, the chances of gene flow are significant. For example, at near distance up to 0.5 meter distance, the chances of outcrossing are 43 to 60% depending on year and up to 50 meter distance, like up to 160 feet distance, you can still get three to 4% of outcrossing, which is again a very large number. This paper is also published um, in scientific reports and it is available online for more information. This is what I have for this topic. Uh, and I believe now we can open for the questions. Yes, thank you. Those are both great presentations. We do not have any questions submitted that I can see. Feel free to submit some if you'd like. I have a uh, a few thoughts. Uh, Pat, I um, one of the questions we get here, and just to sort of set it up for everyone, we're on the eastern side of the Corn Belt, so we don't haven't had water hemp problems as long. Um, we have part of the state that has 
uh, three counties for longer than the rest of the state where I think multiple resistance is most widespread. So, you know, we tell people we can look to Illinois to see, you know, where we're headed if we don't uh, manage this the right way. So I think one of the questions we get is about site 15 herbicides, because I, I think we have people starting to think about using those preventatively in their post applications, you know, to get control later in the season. And so the question I've gotten from several people, it's a good question, I think, or thinking is, you know, do do I just go ahead and pull the trigger and and add those to my program on a preventative basis? Or, or is when I do that, am I just, uh, you know, selecting for the next round of resistance and I should hold off for as long as I can? Well, so unfortunately, as I sort of alluded to, we don't actually have all the information we need to make an informed, you know, a concrete answer. You know, if it's target, so, so, so that strategy definitely will help slow target site resistance. And so because of that, I would recommend doing it. We know it's gonna help on that front. Will it help on slowing metabolic resistance? Maybe, maybe not but at least you're gonna slow target site resistance. And I don't think you're gonna be any worse off necessarily in terms of metabolic based resistance by adding that in as opposed to leaving it out. So that would be the answer that I would come down to. Um, but it goes to try to think about more than just, you know, the more complex your rotation mixture scheme can be, the better off you are. So maybe use a chloracetamide one year, maybe the next year use a, a PPO inhibitor as your pre-emergence product. Right, so we use so we use site 15. I mean, the other question related to that is, so if we if we use a pre-emergence, you're probably going to give me the same, the same answer here. But you know, if we use a combination of herbicides in our pre-emergence that includes site 15 and you know triazine and whatever, um, and then we come back with site 15 post, is that making it worse also, or, or is the answer still well, it really doesn't affect your rate of development? Yeah, I don't think it, it makes it worse. Now, whether it makes it better or not, I'm not sure. So, you know, an analogy would be thinking back to target site resistance. If I used a, 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 a group two herbicide pre and then came back with a group two herbicide post, that's not going to be good, right? You're going to select for group two target site resistance. But would that be worse than just using a group two post and skipping a pre? I don't think it'd be any worse, right? And so I think I can come down the same thing in terms of metabolic resistance. Adding two herbicides, if they, if two herbicides can be metabolized by the same enzyme, adding them two together, you're still selecting for that enzyme. Adding just one of them, you're selecting for that enzyme. So I don't think you're you're worse off by adding the two, and hopefully you're better off because you can take the play the odds that those two there's not going to be a common enzyme that can metabolize both of them. Right. I think I asked that of Aaron Hager, who's your colleague there, and his answer was, yeah, if you need to use the site 15 to manage the population, then you should do it. <laughs> so um, otherwise you're just struggling with control period, which I think also makes some sense. Yeah, obviously you wanna do um, whatever you can to reduce that population. You know, long-term management, obviously the, the fewer, the more seeds you have in your seed bank, uh, the more individuals you are giving the opportunity to have a mutation and become resistant. And so managing that seed bank and particularly preventing plants from going to seed, you know, is what you need to be thinking about, not just thinking about trying to prevent yield loss this year. Right. And that is our message here based on, I think, your experience, which brings me back to Amit, I think. And Amit, the question for you on, uh, you, you, I mean, you can't really figure out what's a female and what a male plant is until you let them get pretty big late in the season right so uh, is yeah. that your only is that your only strategy there yeah for now we don't really have any quick test uh, that can identify whether it's a male water hemp or female water hemp especially when they are at seedling stage uh, so the best uh, practices will be just um, at the end of the season or at least once they will start uh, flowering and then you will be able to make uh, distinguish between them uh, is the only best uh, way we can reduce the female plants and reduce the overall seed production. Right. Or, or I mean, the other strategy is any, if once you see plants poking above the soybean canopy um, late season, just 
take them out regardless, right? Before you wait, before you even wait, needing to see what sex they are. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In Arkansas, that has been reported by Dr. Norsworthy. Like, yeah, they have seen a lot of uh, growers using walking crew just to chop the palmer amaranth uh, in their soybean and cotton fields, and that might help. But again, it will be a very expensive strategy. Right. I, I think we have some drone technology. We've got a project here, and I know there's some other, obviously, lots of things happening with drones and and uh, image recognition and, uh, you know, scouting. And I wonder about late season scouting with drones, I um, whether you could actually get them to the point where they could pick out a female from a, ma a male plant. I think we might be doing well enough just to figure out it's water hemp in a, in a field of soybeans. I'm not sure, but maybe we'll get there, right? Yes, and we have done those studies. Actually, my colleague um, here in uh, biological systems engineering, they have all the UAVs and we have taken some images uh, late in the season. Uh, and uh, at least we were able to identify whether it's a water hemp plant or some other plant. Uh, so we have started something in this direction, but uh, as of now, um, it works in soybean because of uh, very, ability of weed species to grow above the soybean canopies but uh, yeah it's not working in corn because of the competition and height of corn right that's our experience here also well i want to thank both of our speakers today that wraps up today's presentation um a recording of this webinar will be available on the take action website within about a week and that's i will take action.com slash management um, I think you can probably also uh, get the contact information from either speaker uh, online from their website and contact them directly from questions with questions if you have those. Join us next Thursday for another webinar with Dr. Tom Peters talking about the status of research on electricity methods and Dr. John Wallace uh, talking about cover crops and weed management. Um, and you can always uh, register at www.iwilltakeaction.com usually within a couple of days uh, before the next webinar. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.